Welcome to this edition of Skull Sessions. I'm your host, Mike Sendoma, brought to you by Sports Medicine Concepts. And today I have a very special guest joining us on Skull Sessions, and one that I am particularly honored to have with us today. Our guest is the infamous Pepper Burris, retired Green Bay Packers head athletic trainer. And uh, Pepper, I know you to be quite a storyteller from the many tours that you've given us over the years of Lambeau Field. Um, but before I let you uh, get into some of those topics and some of those um, those stories, I have one of my own I want to share. So I, I figured I better get mine out first. Um, so uh, Pepper, I've seen you speak many times over the years, uh, mostly regarding emergency preparedness. Uh, I remember vividly, long before we met actually, I remember vividly sitting in, I think it was a presentation you were doing, um, at the NATA, and you put up a slide. Uh, and during that presentation, uh, you put up a slide of an injured football player in a fencing position. Uh, fencing position being an athlete that's neurologically injured will also will oftentimes present kind of like they're fencing, and it's just an indication of a neurological type of injury. And your comment uh, that you made when you showed that slide was that uh, as an ATC or an, as an athletic trainer, sometimes you know an athlete is critically injured before you even step out onto the field to go out after them, and you just get this you just get this feeling that something isn't right with the situation that you're looking at. Uh, whether it's a feeling or a visual, you, you just have a sense that today is a little bit different or this injury scenario is a little bit different, and. Of all the presentations I've seen you give since, it's that that has stuck with me because, unfortunately, uh, that has proven true for me a couple of times in my career as well. So I, I remember that uh, and uh, noted Pepper Burris in my mind as a result of that and followed you uh, in your career long before we met. and. After the Dennis Bird accident, uh, which I, I believe was 1993, uh, I read up everything that there was to read on that uh, on that incident. Uh, everything that you said about it, every book that was written about it afterwards, press releases, every, I, I read up and, and made it a point to study that. And why, why do I bring all this up? Because that in the course of that, I gained a lot of respect for you uh, prior to ever having the opportunity to meet you. Um, so when we started working with the NFL, when our, our program kind of started to become adapted by medical teams in the NFL, uh, I knew that you were an athletic trainer with the Green Bay Packers that had emergency response well under control. I just knew that. So my thought was, all right, well, there's 32 teams in the NFL uh, one of them is a Green Bay Packers, so we'll be lucky if we work with 31 because we're probably never going to have the opportunity to work with the Green Bay Packers. So I said, all right, that, that's fine. And then one day, I'm sitting in my office, and I'll be completely honest with you, I got up from my desk and was on the way to the restroom. And the phone rings, and uh, it didn't even give me reason to pause until the phone says, call from Green Bay Packers. And I stopped dead in my tracks. 180 degrees and I thought to myself this phone call is not going to voicemail there is no way this is going to voicemail unless you had to get to the bathroom right, well I, I couldn't have got it there's very few instances where I couldn't have put that off uh, and and there you have it uh, it was you on the phone uh, inquiring about us coming out and working with the Green Bay Packers and I was honored that you thought enough about what we had accomplished over the, the years previous uh, to warrant us coming out. And I know you were kind of, I'm, I'm pretty sure in the back of your mind, you were kind of like, well, uh, this is kind of interesting. Let's have them out and see. Let's, let's just see if they have anything to offer us. Um, so I was honored to have that opportunity uh, and have been honored every year since then to work with the Green Bay Packers, even now uh, that you've retired from that. So uh, I'm, I'm, again, that's, that's how I've gotten to this point. And now here we are uh, with you joining us on Skull Sessions in the podcast. So 
I'm, I'm honored to have this opportunity. Uh, I believe uh, the experiences you've had throughout your career are something that, that we can all learn from. And I'm hoping that through some of the experiences and some of the stories you tell about your experiences that we can bring that across to the listeners today. So let, let me start. Let me get you started. And I, I think once we get you started, I, I think that's it, it's going to be uh, a, a pretty easy time we're going to have of it from that point forward. A lot of your listeners don't remember the wind-up toys where you pulled the string on the back and they just went. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if, if they're old enough to remember that, just pull my string is what you're saying. That's what I'm, all right, so here, number one, I'm going to pull the string. Uh, let, let's go back to 1993. And I'm going to open up with, with, uh, November 29th, 1992, 1992. Okay. November 29th, Kansas city chiefs, Meadowland stadium. So you gained some notoriety for your involvement, uh, with that incident. Um, but you had mentioned to me, uh, in our conversations leading up to getting ready for this podcast, that it was kind of happenstance that you were the one at the head and neck of Dennis bird that day. Well, yeah. The fact of the matter is that, Two of our athletes, the Orchette players, crashed into each other. They were going to make a sandwich out of the quarterback, one coming from the left, one coming from the right. And the quarterback, Dave Craig, stepped up into the pocket at the last second, and Dennis Bird and Scott Mercero crashed into each other. And they both went in reverse right onto their back. Bang. Bob Reese, my boss, the head athletic trainer, and myself, we see it happen, and as you kind of alluded to, you see things happen. We were almost in motion before, you know, they before we realized they were down. And as you say, happenstance or otherwise, I went to Dennis, and Bob went to Scott. Uh, very rare to have two of your own athletes mm -hmm. down at the same time. And um, as you would say, the rest is history. So. Uh, Reflecting back on that day, uh, what what do you feel that that injury has meant to the athletic training profession? What would you say that we've gained or have yet to gain from from that injury situation? Because it it is it it is a fairly infamous situation or uh, injury scenario. Well, to be a little self deprecating is that many have come before and many will come after and done a fine job. And for some reason, this seemed to take on a life of its own. Um, you know, Dennis was honored at the NATA. He made a profound recovery, uh, blessed beyond belief how he's come back from quadriplegia. And uh, tragically, uh, two years ago, he was killed in a car accident. But aside from that, my involvement became somewhat of legend for no good reason at all. Uh, and I'm not trying to be humble or otherwise. Uh, so many other athletic trainers have boarded athletes, have had great results, some have had bad results, and I'd like to say no fault of their own. Um, because if we do what we're trained to do and we do it flawlessly, then the rest is up to God and the circumstances of what happened. So ours turned out very well. And as I've alluded, it became somewhat of legend that we did something magical, but we didn't. Things worked right. And uh, I will tell you that uh, 10 hours after that injury, when I was finally sitting down to have a bite to eat with our team doctor, I was just going back and forth. Did we move him too much? And I don't think I used the we. I said, did I? How do I know if I move that neck too much? How do I know if I did this? And he just said, hey. You did the best you could. You did as we were trained. You you did as we drilled. And there you have it. And uh, once again, the rest is history. So we've also talked a little bit about the support network from you know those athletic trainers that have had the unfortunate experience of dealing with a situation like that, and how sometimes uh, we forget about the caregivers. Uh, in the maybe some of the support they they need as well so what what did the incident and your involvement in that incident what did it mean to you personally well i uh, i can remember some that called and there were many and they would say how are you 
and because this is this is before there's any recovery um so we don't know how it's going to turn out or it did turn out so kent falb former detroit lion head athletic trainer president of the nata called me up and said uh and being my senior and one of my mentors how you doing young man and because he had been there in his career Mm. Uh, you have to time some things out, but with Mike Utley, so big publicity there and uh, ended up with uh, some permanent paralysis as Dennis had some weakness and issues as well, but pretty profound recovery. But what that taught me was always be in line to call another colleague around the league when there's a trauma or an event um, a death in a locker room, how rare that is, a coach, someone with cancer, someone, a big event, and you call them and just say, how you doing, man? And I'm careful not to say, been there, done that. Because unless you've walked in someone's shoes, you don't have the right to really say, I know how you feel. Mm -hmm. And maybe you do, but um, it is what it is. But be there to support our brethren and sister in and those around the league, not only the league, in the profession to say, if you know him enough to call to say, how you doing, man? And just leave it at that, you know, don't, how'd you do, what happened, what happened, what's this, what's, uh, it's not about, not about debriefing, let them talk. They need someone to talk to that at least as a compadre and kind of gets it. I, I see Kent Falb as being a, a good guy for that. I've I've gotten to uh, to know uh, Kent um, just in my dealings with uh, PFAT's vendor show, and he was in charge of the vendor show for a long time. And he's always like this fatherly figure that walks around, and he, he's always makes it a point to come come up and say hi to you. And, and he even. I uh, even gave my son, uh, who was at the trade show with me one year, gave him lessons on how to shake hands appropriately. And, and yeah, he's, yeah, he's very much that fatherly figure. I, l- I look forward to seeing him. I can see him reaching out and being a, 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 a good confidant to you in that situation. Well, I think we all, all athletic trainers, have got people they look up to from that were their mentors. In my case, probably as, as famous an athletic trainer mentor as I could have as I chose to leave my home state of New York and go, what, had the audacity to go 800 miles away to Indiana to go to Purdue University and study under Pinky Newell, the late Pinky Newell. And of course, Pinky and Denny, Denny Miller, NATA president, <laughs> all as well. And people around the league, obviously I was in the NFL at the time, but the late Fred Zamberletti and Ian Kleinschmidt calling and Jerry Ray calling and people that I would say, why are you calling me? I mean, yeah. I'm just, you know, but they were there just to give you that little, you know, how you doing? Yeah. So if you don't mind, I really enjoyed hearing the story that you told uh, about loading Dennis Bird into the ambulance, all, all the, the stuff that went on during transport. You told the story of uh, uh, trying to get the fasteners off, and and those. Would if, if you don't mind revisiting that again, I, I think that's just a great story. Well, there, a few of them became life's lessons, in that we had our spine board, spine board bag had our little bag of tools in it. I'm a tool guy, and it. I don't want to say regress, but let me jump off to say that there are certain people that can handle tools and certain people who don't. And I like to joke, you know, if you don't know it, uh, Phillips said from a crescent wrench, you might be in trouble. But if you know you've got two left hands when it comes to using tools and stuff, maybe you're not the right person to be in charge unless that's the option you have. But I was always a tool guy and we had a pack of tools on our board. The situation took place with Dennis that is before our head, neck and spine committee decided that the face mask would come off before you put somebody in a rig in the ambulance. But in this case, he was 
move to a, a Miller board at the time. I think there are other uh, better, better sized boards these days and you go through all of them. But at any rate, he was boarded. Um, straps worked well. We had tested our straps on all different size athletes because if you're strapping an athlete that has a thigh the size of a normal person's waist, some of the straps that come on some of this equipment are not going to fit. And let me digress as well. One of my first honors ever as a athletic trainer to speak was at the NATA in 1981 in Philadelphia. I was asked to speak because I had done some training as an EMT. And the title of my talk was Emergency Medicine, Do We Fit? And I think people ask, do we as athletic trainers fit in? Well, sure we do. Absolutely do. But do we fit with the equipment we are carrying? Back in those days, we carried air splints. And an extra large air splint would not fit over a big football shoe. It wasn't going to fit. An awful lot of things that had straps or traction splints and some of these spine boards and all these different things and the straps didn't fit and we were carrying airways that weren't big enough or in some cases small enough because I realized once with one of our spine boards if I happen to be asked to go cover my cousin's soccer game that if you happen to carry your bag and some equipment with you those straps might be too big mm. to use on a small athlete so we added d-rings to things and on and on so coming back to center He's on his board. He's onto the golf cart. I was riding on the back. Dr. Elliot Hirschman was, and Joe Patton was driving it into the tunnel in the Meadowlands and into the back of the ambulance. And I'm up at the, I've got my back to the driver in the ambulance, who was a modular. And as we're doing that, I'm realizing I don't have any tools with me other than my pro orthopedic scissors. And I yelled to our equipment man, the late Bill Hampton, say, Hamp, Hamp, screwdriver. I remember him reaching in his back pocket and throwing me, I think it was a combination straight Phillips head for one of the reversible mm. screwdrivers. And I was happy because I'm going to take his loop straps off of his helmet. And doors and the ambulance close and we're pulling out. And then Dennis is conscious, but he can't move anything from his neck down. And his wife is sitting to my left, kind of with her back against the, the side door and on. And we're pulling away. And I said, Dennis, and his helmet is strapped. And I'm holding it as best I can with one hand because I'm going to use the screwdriver with the other. And the first, I don't remember if the first screw loosened and came out or if the first one didn't. But I know three of the four did not. Mm. And they were locked up. They were locked up tighter than Fort Knox. They weren't coming out. I said, oh, beautiful. So I've got no other tools with me. Now, fortunately, Dennis Knott's in any breathing emergency. And as you would know, and you train us all, we can get that helmet off without having to cut things. I mean, you put it on that way, you can get it off with safety. Mm -hmm. So I said, Dennis, I'm going to have to do something else when we get to the ER. And I asked Dr. Stephen Nicholas, who was at the, at the, of the ambulance with the paramedic the ems whoever it was they were taking off shoes and cutting some pant legs and things and i said steve is there a cast saw in the emergency room and he kind of gave me that look like of course there is and i said great and i didn't say i whispered to dennis but i am inches away from his face and i said hey dennis when we get to the emergency room i'm going to take a saw-like machine and make some noise, and I'm just going to cut these couple of loop straps on your on your face mask. And and he was like, and I and I wouldn't be surprised if he said, "Okay, Peppy, as call me that." And you said, "How could he be in a chipper mood like that?" He was unbelievable in that ambulance. He wanted he's a devout Christian, wanted to play, pray with his wife. And I remember him praying. He said, "Thank you, Lord, for putting me in this position." because you'll know I'll be strong enough to stand up under it. And I remember kind of gagging like, goo, goo, goo. <laughs> here's a man paralyzed from his neck down. I'm holding his, his limp hand as best I can. We're praying. And he said that. I said, wow, it's a man of faith. Yeah. In the ER, 
up onto the x-ray table. I actually was kneeling up on it, holding his head. He was still on the board, and that, that little cast saw came out, and it took seconds. Zit, zit, zit. Three loop straps are cut. Pull the hel helmet with one hand and pull the, the face mask back with the other, and off it came. And that was just one of them. I said, oh, boy, it's going to be that kind of day. Yeah. And, uh, uh, one of the things we want to take home message with that is that I had a little packet of tools in my spine bag. At that time, your, your uh, cutter had not been invented by, back then, but I had every different configuration of things with me, and um, you know where that bag of tools was, was still on the field in the bag, and it should have come with me, and it didn't. And we, we've kind of learned that and changed that over the years that the, there's actually a redundant, well, we have a redundant spine board on the field. So that set of tools can go with the caregiver who, who accompanies a player to the emergency room. So that was one of life's lessons there. And it's to this day still is with us. It, it's interesting that the cast saw because it, did you ever you ever see the TV series uh, Friday Night Lights? Are, are you? F uh, I I I tended not to be one of those watchers. I've yeah. never watched Hard Knocks. I never watched North Dallas Forty in its own because there's truisms in all of this stuff, but some of those things make light of. You know, there was even a movie made of the Dennis Bird situation, and, mm. and my friends were calling me like crazy because look at my hair now. But I was a dark, <laughs> curly haired, and some old geezer was playing my role. <laughs> and the thing that just irked me is how Pepper, the athletic trainer, walked into the locker room and said, Hey, anybody else got to be taped? It's kind of the last call or whatever was said. And I'm like, no athletic trainer in the world does that. No. We're just, we're just trying to get done taping so we can put our shoes on and go on the field. Yeah, we don't want, we don't want anyone else coming in. <laughs> Any, anybody else need help? I'm here. I would say, oh, boy, oh, boy. But I did get a lot of phone calls saying, hey, it was, it was just the time I had come out to Green Bay. So it was in a 93 year, maybe. And they said, Pepper, you got a little bit older and put on a few pounds, and oh boy, oh boy. So. I I found that uh, Friday Night Lights interesting because in the first two ep two or three episodes of that uh, TV series, uh, the quarterback for for the team gets critically injured and is and is paralyzed, and uh, of course, being in the topic area that I'm in, I watched that you know pretty closely how that was managed and what uh drama they put into that scenario and uh I, I can only imagine that they had somebody they consulted with to make sure they were reasonably accurate but i found it funny that when they took that player to the emergency room they used a cast saw but this time they used it unlike you to to cut the loop straps they used it to to transect the helmet down the middle and cut the helmet off right down the middle and then split the helmet and that's how they took the helmet off the athlete and i thought i have never heard of anyone even suggesting that a cast saw be used in that in that situation so when you mentioned that the other day that you used the cast saw, i'm like i wonder if somehow that that's what got around and that was the impetus because otherwise i've never heard i don't, I don't know who would have suggested that that be. i believe you absolutely could Use yeah. other than the dust and on and on and uh -huh. little heat generation and on and of course you've got all the internal components of the helmet but yeah. you know, a cast saw just vibrates and right. it would I believe it would cut the polycarbonate or whatever you have a helmet but the point that I want to go back to is that in successive stories written thereafter that I accompanied Dennis to the emergency room because my boss, Bob Reese, the head athletic trainer, was not going to leave the field. I was the logical number mm -hmm. two in command to go. And again, I was kind of kind of the EMS guy. I had taken 
two, two levels of New York EMT training and had volunteered to do some teaching with it and on and on. So that was my, my, my bag ever since my little green American Red Cross first aid book that I took in high school at the local firehouse. So I was always intrigued with that end of the, the industry. But in some of those articles is this, and then Burris cut the helmet off. Mm -hmm. And now you can't, you can talk to a newspaper, but you can't, <laughs> hey, yeah. that's wrong. That's right, wrong. I, didn't, right, right. I didn't, I did not take a German saw, you know, the big chain, the big <laughs> saw with the big blade and, you know, that they used to take a car apart. I did not have jaws of life with me. Yeah. I did not cut the helmet off. Right. Well, you know, that, that's, that's good drama. That's good in the print, but yeah, that uh, you, you can kind of hear the collective gasp of the athletic training community when stuff like that is printed you know the, we all know that that wouldn't happen but you know I, I guess it makes for good drama good tv right the sidebar for you too you say that you pull the string and i talk as i had come out here the first of 93 just a, a long month after dennis had been paralyzed mm -hmm. and um the 92 year at the packers the Packers had taken one of their linebackers off the field on a board. I was not here. I don't remember seeing film of it. But I got here, and a local ambulance firm in the state wrote a letter to me, the head trainer, new head trainer, congratulations. Um, we would really like to come up and help you set up an emergency action plan scenario because, as you know, this particular player at the Packers, not by name, was removed from the field. And maybe you know that at the New York Jets, Dennis Bird was taken off the field. And there was verbiage that said, we can help improve on both of those scenarios. <laughs> so they, did, they didn't know who they were talking to, apparently. <laughs> No, but they also didn't know that I ate that letter right there in my hand. I just, I, maybe I set it on fire with my finger. I'll bet, I'll bet you did. <laughs> but there was a follow-up phone call to the gentleman in charge of that ambulance crew out of his in-state. And uh, I, think I, I, I think I heard him swallow the phone. I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah, I'm sure he was eating every word that he wrote, you yeah. know. Well, uh, in addition to, uh, you know, your work with the Packers and with the Jets, you also, uh, as a member of the Professional Football Athletic Trainers Society, you also served on the head, neck, uh, and spine medical committee, as well as serving two terms um, on the executive committee. Uh, during, during that time, uh, what are some challenges that you faced uh, early on in your career that maybe are not challenges today, maybe because of technological advancements, maybe because of your work on the committee. And also what are some challenges that are still there today that, that we haven't been able to, to, over, to seem to overcome? Well, you know, you're, you're, you're lobbing me up a couple, you know, maybe I should just have the softball bat and hitting them out, out of the park. <laughs> but the thing that we have battled forever, but we are winning is identity. We've had an identity crisis because the word trainer, we, we don't really, we don't train anything. They train animals and horses and dogs and whatever. Um, yes, and the NATA has had committee after committee. Is there a better descriptor name, you know, athletic therapist, on and on. And certainly now we have settled on the fact that we don't want to be Pepper the trainer. We want to be Pepper the athletic trainer. Because as we know, there's an awful lot of personal trainers and every different type of trainer there is known to persons. So identity has been something, acceptance. And I you know, could happen on the way up the stairs, but whenever I go to my grave, just wonder is there going to be more and more progress of getting healthcare on the sidelines of every contact sport um, is contact sport the only and I'm, am I alluding to football yes they say that dance is contact football is collision but 
soccer has a tremendous amount of concussions and potential head injuries and of course hockey and blah, blah, blah. But we need trained people on the sideline. So it's not the coach that hasn't thought about how to do A, B, or C, or how long it's going to take to get an ambulance at a place that's not covering and what states and counties have those requirements, on and on and on. So I think that the, we've made tremendous progress to that end. Um, my goodness gracious, the, the students that are coming out of school, the graduates now, they make us oldsters look like we were just dummies. I mean, their advanced practice, their their standards, the technological things they're dealing with, and you yourself with the advances that you have made with teaching to the point that in your learning center or whatever your training center you're calling it now is beyond my comprehension of what that would offer to someone to experience in real, real life scenarios, scenario, scenario, however you're saying it. But when I trained with CPR, we had Resusiani, and oh boy, when they added that little set of lights to it, and you're like, wow. I, and, I remember and, those. And, and, wait a minute, how yeah. about when they added the, they added the strip recorder to it? Woo right, yeah, I remember. Now, now my wife is a PhD nurse educator, and in your world, we've got We've got, I'm going to do it. We've got dummies. No, I'm the dummy. We've got dummies now that you can, you know, you're hooked to your iPad. What am I saying? It can do everything to say, hey, too hard, too strong, too fast. Oh, by the way, do you realize that they are now in VTA? And, and just, yeah. so the training and the people that are coming out, I am so thankful for my, my two children are beyond competition years, but I now have a granddaughter and maybe a another one or two in time, who knows, but I just know that healthcare around athletics is going to be better than it was yesterday. It's just the way it is. If, if you, if you were to look back, uh, and maybe I'm rephrasing the question, uh, but reflecting back on Dennis Bird, reflecting back on Mike Utley, um, reflecting back on some of the other injuries that have happened. Um, what, what have we done a good job learning from those instances and implementing as far as emergency action planning and emergency response? And what are, what are some things that continue to be problematic for us in as far as emergency action plan? What have we not learned well from those instances? I don't know if I'm expert expert enough to tell you that. I can just look back. You know, we are talking about an incident that was 28, 29 years ago, older than some of the people maybe listening to this. Well, certainly older than them. And the biggest challenge I had, we had at that time, was communication game was over. We were all over a hospital. We're up and down between departments. People wanted to go. This was New York, Metro New York. The world wanted to know what was going on. And we, we didn't have all of the telecommunication and computers that everybody's carrying on their hip. So that's a moot point. But the physical act of the transfer, limited movement, boards have changed. That the technique is still there of how you do it, but oh my goodness, has equipment changed? The helmets, the face mask, loop straps. Uh, now has communications changed? My goodness, everybody's got it. Um, recording of said event. Now we don't have to talk about just pro sports, but if it's an NFL game, there's a sky camera directly over top of you, and it disgust me it makes me crazy because someone may be bleeding and grandma's home at home seeing her baby boy bleeding and the athlete might be crying so i i digress that makes me nuts but as athletic trainers and caregivers on the field we have to be cognizant of the optics that we are presenting one how confident we are with our staff of what we're doing 
And two, there's probably someone in the stands on the sidelines who is recording what we're doing. And I'm not trying to be dramatic saying, hey, do I move my elbow a certain way so I look like I did a better job? No, but you've just got to be conscious that we've always said practice makes perfect. So if you're practicing and you think it's going to be perfect, that's a misnomer. Mm -hmm. In the Absolutely EMS, is. I remember, yeah. I remember saying, "Perfect practice makes perfect." Why do you drill CPR down to the last millisecond? Because when you're in the field, if you've got a, I'm going to make this up, a 10% flaw error, you're still 90% good. Right. But if you're kind of a 50-50 learner and you screw up, but you know, you're, think about what you've got. Perfect practice makes perfect. And then there's just the unexpected weather conditions. Who's to say it's going to be a bright 72 degree day with mm -hmm. no wind? It could be pouring rain and you're out in mud. It could be, well, Green Bay, Wisconsin, right. Minnesota, Buffalo, the great Northeast. It could be whatever temperature and you know, we've, we've done a little bit of battle about, well, an athlete should be totally stripped down and everything taken off before you put them on the board. And those are all discussable points in your action plan. And just the fact that those words never existed, an action plan. Right. Um, now we reduce them to writing. I used to have a president at one of my organizations that said, be careful what you write down. They can hold you to it. Okay. Or... Also, write down what you write down because that's your, going to be your standard of care. Right. But uh, there's so many things to learn. And I think that's the important thing is you can learn from everything you do that if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. So, yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not the man of cliches here, but uh, we learned about carrying our tools. We learned about having a redundant set of tools. We learned about having a redundant backboard because what's the chance that you put someone on, a, on an immobilization system and a quarter later, it happens again? Well, does the other team have one? Did the other team come without one? Is it a home game? Is it an away game? And in the same respect, one of the things you and I chatted about and prep for this was I believe we still do this is we call it a jump kit. Now you could call your tools a jump kit, but on the field and in the locker room, we have a small zipper bag that has probably the single most important thing in it that you could take in an emergency, if especially you're on the road, is a phone charger. If you're all carrying a certain product type of phone, in our case, we would all had iPhones. We had charger in it and we had a pen and paper in it. We had a hundred dollars in it and you used to carry a phone list. Well, now you don't. The phone list is in mm -hmm. your little computer on your mm -hmm. hip. But the last thing you want to be is in an emergency room, bouncing around a hospital and you look at your phone and it's saying low power mode and you, you're not going to go to the nurse's station and say, can I borrow, do you have a charger? <laughs> and now you're about to lose your communication. And so we have a bag like that on the sideline in our kit and in a locker room. And you say, why? Well, you may leave for the emergency room from the locker room, or you may leave for the emergency room from the sideline. So someone would, if we might be rolling someone in a gurney toward the tunnel and one of the staff has already run over to the trunk and grabbed the jump kit and doesn't have any candy bars in it, but, uh, <laughs> but it's got a hundred bucks, <laughs> but in the same respect, when you're on the road now, maybe in high school and the like, you're within the conference in professional sports, you could be across the country and you're not going to get back to your clothes. You may be in soaking wet gear from being in rain and the host team is probably going to go to the locker room and get your clothes and bring them. You may not be home for two days and it's kind of nice to have a phone charger and whatever, but you say, you know, that is, you know, that's such minutia. I said, no, 
that's you got to think in the box you got to think out of the box you just have to think and wow. learn a little bit you know and say how we prepare for the worst we hope for the best all of these are classic ems lines prepare for the worst hope for the best well you know if you're sitting around one day and say okay if this happens here and this happens there and we had it at the new york jets I was looking at our practice field and there's a little man gate, chain link man gate that you got on and off the field. And I looked over at the double gate that had this big old chunk of chain on it with a lock on it saying, if we have to get EMS in, how do we get them in? And some people said, well, most of these rigs carry in bolt cutters or jokingly dynamite or whatever they're doing. <laughs> but just that I just think about those things. Like, you know, how are you going to, are you going to get the golf cart off if it's whatever happens? You know, you got it on, you got it off. Or the groundskeeper locked it to keep everybody out, and he's over mowing the lawn on the next field. You don't have keys. Just things. Just, you know, drill down, drill it down a little deeper than you thought about. Uh, you've, you've mentioned a couple of times the, the, the tool kits, the jump kits, and stuff like that. I know from my experience in working with you that your tool kit, has a lot of your own tools in it. And I don't mean wrenches that you bought, screwdrivers that you bought. I mean, little tools that you have, that you have actually made yourself to help you in certain situations. Well, help me, help me with our uh, uh, the hardware where you push the piston in on it. Yeah. Does it have a name for it? Quick, quick release? Quick, quick release. release, yeah, yeah. quick release, you've got, yeah. You've got, you've got quarter turn screws and of course, a Phillips head would do that. Yeah. But if you've got to push in that little almost ratchet release on a quick release and you don't have something with you, you're saying, well, a ballpoint pen. Well, yeah, maybe. So even on our little tiny stubby Phillips head screwdriver, I took a piece of coat hanger and bent it appropriately. Yeah. So it was a little three inch piece that could swing out and it became the tool to press in yeah. that loop block, the, 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 the little, and I said, if you're out there with your scissors and you're like, hey, who's got a, now I'm going to use an old word, who's got a big pen? No, you don't have a big pen. Said, you need to push those little tiny releases in. So you're talking about, and then many of our kits, I would take a piece of coat hanger, four inches long, bend a little loop at the top of it, wrap some power flex around it so it had a little bit of a handle. And those were in my fanny pack. Those yeah. were in our kit. Those were on a jump. Can't have I, enough tools. I remember the first time we were out there and that thing came out of your time. I'm like, what, what the hell is that? What, 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 do, what, what do you do with that? And then when you show me, I'm like, it's genius. It's you take a coat hanger. There's a little bit of flex tape around the end of it, so I, so you didn't cut your hand when you were holding it. And doink, there you go. I literally had refined that a little <laughs> tiny bit with our screwdriver to put the little loop at the top and screw it right into the handle of the screwdriver. Yeah. And now you could flip it down, and if you need it, you flip it back out, and it just, you know. Yeah, I, and didn't, then, I didn't patent the uh, the pepper coat hanger pusher inner little thinger. Oh, that, that you should have done that because if you did, you'd probably be in some uh, some some tropical island. We we'd be we'd be doing this interview, and you'd be in a hammock I'm in some tropical island. island. I'm in a tropical island, Green yeah. Bay, Wisconsin. All right. Uh, during that first time we were out there with you in Green Bay too, we also. Uh, as part of our equipment that we have with our setup is we use the pro strap. And I came to learn that you were instrumental in the pro strap as well. And that, that is something that we, it's, it's in all of our equipment simulation kits that we have. 100% mine. Yeah. 100% mine. And interestingly, how that came to be was, and you can add better history than I, but I had one of the first motorized boards brought to me 20 years ago mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it had side handles on it and certainly it did a beautiful job of getting under an immobile patient beautiful job it was heavy it was expensive at the time but there was 
no way to secure and hold the head. Sure, you could maybe have sandbags or whatever you would mm -hmm. do, but there was no, I'm going to invent a word, no strap ability. So I looked at a pro orthopedic piece of neoprene, probably one that was used for like a shoulder immobilizer or something. And said, wow, if this wrapped around, if the neoprene could be down against the head or the helmet, so it wouldn't, it would kind of bite it. And then have someone sew some Velcro on, reversed on both sides, so it would flip up over and tighten. Did that, worked, called Jerry Deddy at Pro Orthopedics. He said, oh, Pepper, we're going to call it the Pepper Strap or whatever. And, you know, we'll send you a dollar from each one. I said, yeah, great. I'll be able to buy a cup of coffee. And I said, no, don't do that. But you send a dollar from every one that gets sold to the Pinky Newell Scholarship at the NATA. And whether that still happens, but I've given away dozens and dozens and dozens of those to our EMS people because to me, the neoprene will grab a helmet. It'll grab a helmet with a face mask, without a face yeah. mask, or it'll even come across and grab a even a kind of wet forehead as yeah, well. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting you bring it up. I've almost forgotten about it, but that, yeah. And uh, it, it's a, it's an integral piece of equipment. Like I said, it, it, it works so well that it is part of the equipment and each one of the emergency kits that we have with our simulation uh, kits. So it, it's, it's an integral piece of equipment that we use routinely as part of the protocol that, that we teach. Interestingly as well, I can't, I can't find a source for it anymore. Do, do you know, is anyone selling it? You, you do a... Pro Orthopedics doesn't make it anymore? I'll, I'll have to look into that, but... Uh, oh, no, Jerry, Jerry, Deddy, Jerry Deddy made those at Pro Orthopedics. And now whether in the last couple of years have they been sold to other companies, but, you know, Moose Deddy, the late head athletic trainer of the Philadelphia Eagles, invented the entire world of neoprene skin diving equipment for sports. And of mm -hmm. course, now everybody thinks they've been around forever. Well, that's reasonably forever, the last 40 years, 30 years. Yeah. But um, yeah, I did the strap and in the same respect, we would always want to put something if you're putting a head on on a board yeah we want to have some packing around the head i took some uh knee sleeves or a shin sleeve and put some of the temper type foam in it and those rolls became the rolls that we would put under that strap because once again neoprene against neoprene was rather adherent right yeah slippery. yeah worked yeah. well so yeah. uh had some uh, fun playing with neoprene I'll, I'll have to look at uh, look, but uh, our our normal source that we used to buy them from just normal sports medicine supply companies. You know your your traditional sports medicine suppliers. They uh, I can't find it. it. It used to be just part of our annual and anytime we went in our annual budget that we were outfitting some of our equipment cases and stuff. It was just part of our it was a line item for us to buy those. And then uh, it, they're they're becoming harder to find and. And not really, because with SMC and you get a little bit of neoprene and you put one of your staff with a sewing machine and some Velcro, because the typical neoprene would, ex it was neoprene on one side and it kind of a loop lockish material on the yeah. back. Yeah. So when you, when you flop that Velcro around the straps, it naturally tightened wherever you put it. Yep. Yeah, it was perfect. Please, it, please, please call Jerry out there and say that Pepper wants to give him a piece of his mind. All right, I'll do that. I'll I'll find him and I'll do that. Uh, Pepper, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I I appreciate the fact that you, know, you took some time out of your day uh, to visit with us, and it's always a pleasure to hear your stories. It's always a pleasure, uh, not only from the story aspect, but I I just. The, the insight that your stories offer and, and what we can learn from that. So I want to thank you for taking time out and spending some time with us. I'm sure our listeners are going to enjoy uh, what you've had to say. So thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it very much. Let's end it with the fact that if, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. And if you don't share your history, 
someone else may be doomed to repeat it. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, Pepper. I enjoyed Talk it. You, brother. All yeah, right. Bye.